It's Getting Better All the Time Mental Health Outreach with your host, Sister Ayla Gray, a clinical social worker with years of community mental health experience. And today we're going to talk about suicide. Grayson Murray, in case many of you who don't know who he is, Grayson Murray is a famous, or was a famous golfer, died by suicide earlier this month. His family in a statement said, we have spent the last 24 hours trying to come to terms with the fact that our son is gone. It's surreal that we not only have to admit it to ourselves, but we also have to acknowledge it to the world. It's a nightmare. This is his family, they said in the statement. We would like to thank the PGA Tour and the entire world of golf for the outpouring of support. The, the statement goes on to say, life wasn't always easy for Grayson. And although he took his own life, we know he rests peacefully now. Murray had battled depression and anxiety early in life and also sought treatment for alcohol abuse. In January, he had been sober for several months. And this, I'm reading this statement is from his, his parents uh, made this statement and I got this from uh, Fox News. So when someone dies by suicide, especially someone as famous as he is, right? Um, def as famous as he is and as young as he is, many times people have a lot of questions like why? Why did he die by suicide? Why did he take his own life? Um, questions like that. Well, we know that there's really no one, one answer why a person dies by suicide. There's no one answer. There's a lot of times it's a combination of things. According to this that we read, uh, his parents said he had battled depression and anxiety early in his life and also sought treatment for alcohol abuse. So we don't know what was going on with him at that particular moment because we weren't there. But we can say, I can tell you that when a person dies by suicide, at that moment, they feel like that is the only option, right? At that particular moment, they, be, they don't think, uh, uh, you know, depression is one of those things that, you know, you get tunnel vision. And when a person is at that point, they feel like that's all they know is what they're feeling at the moment, right? So again, I wanted to just share a few reasons. Again, there's no one reason why a person decides to die by suicide. There are a couple of reasons that we can point to. But there's really no one reason. We know that many times depression plays a big role and untreated or poorly treated mental illness plays a big role. But we also know that everyone who has, who is diagnosed with depression or who has a poorly treated uh, mental health diagnosis does not die by suicide. So it's not like an, an automatic. And I have to say that as I read this, these here. Okay, why? Mental health disorders. Conditions like depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia can significantly impair judgment and increase suicidal thoughts. And that's the thing, when we talk about depression or bipolar or schizophrenia, we're talking about diseases that impact the way a person thinks. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are connected. And if I start thinking like life is hopeless, and I start feeling hopeless, then I'm going to behave in a hopeless manner. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are connected. At that particular moment, depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia, when you're dealing with the symptoms, at that moment, you're dealing with the symptoms. You're, you're in the middle of the fight. People use words like it's a battle dealing with depression. They use words like fighting. Depression is one of those things, poorly treated depression, um, untreated depression is one of those things, it, it, it hurts, it, you, you feel it. So again, why do people die by suicide? I'm just reading off a few reasons. There is no one particular reason uh, that we can point to many times. Many times it's a combination of things. These are just a few. Number one, mental health disorders. We look at depression, we look at schizophrenia, we look at bipolar. Having those disorders itself doesn't mean that a person is going to die by suicide, but having those, disor those disorders means that you're dealing with an illness where that will impair your judgment, that will impair your thinking, that will impair your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And that's why it's so important that we get help for these particular illnesses. Not just these, but all of them. But mental health disorders, substance abuse, right? Alcohol and drugs can exacerbate mental health issues and lead to impulsive behavior. Because once you start drinking or once you start using drugs, you start, you know, 
for some people, you know, alcohol and drugs may take you up, your mood up, and then some people it may take your mood down. And then for some people, you may be up, and then it, you know, brings you back down. But again, we know that alcohol and drugs can exacerbate, can add to the feelings of depression, can make a person feel invincible. It can impair your judgment. Anything that impairs your judgment is a problem, okay? So again, we're looking at why do people die by suicide, mental health disorders, substance abuse, chronic pain and physical illness, persistent physical pain, or terminal illness can lead to feelings of hopelessness. Okay? Um, that's one, number three. Number four, trauma and abuse. Experiences of trauma, including physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, can have long lasting psychological impacts. What do you mean? Long lasting psychological impacts that can lead to depression, that can lead to anxiety, that can lead to borderline personality disorders, that can lead to um, alcohol, substance abuse, which means now that you're in a high risk, that you have some of these markers that could um, point to death by suicide. Again, doesn't this doesn't mean that just because a person has a chronic pain that they're dep they're depressed they're dealing with trauma and abuse or have a history of trauma and abuse doesn't mean that they're going to die by suicide these are just some of the the categories things that we pay attention to okay um, social isolation loneliness and a lack of social support can intensify feelings of worthlessness because what happens is when we look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and how uh, those are connected. When we're by ourselves, right, and we're caught up in our, our feelings of depression, it's like tunnel vision. That's all you can think about. All you can think about is things are not working out, um, nobody loves me, I feel like things are not, you know, things are not going my way, everybody hates me, nobody, things will never, you know, when we start using these words like never, everybody, always, you know, those are big words, right? Those are big words, and a lot of times when we use them, we use them incorrectly. When nobody likes me, I will never get a job. How do you know that you will never get a job? How do you know that nobody likes you? You only met a few people. So again, but when we're isolated by ourselves, the only thoughts, the only people that we have to confer with is us right and if I am down I'm depressed I'm already beating myself up and I'm conferring my, with myself I'm not helping out myself much so again loneliness and a lack of social support can intensify feelings of worthlessness because then you start thinking well why am I alone and why this and, and then I'm sick and what's going on so again thoughts feelings and behaviors the good thing about when we have support systems, and so it's so important to find, you find your, your tribe, tribe, to find people that you can connect with. Because what happens, what people will do for you, they will challenge those thoughts. Because at that moment, when you get caught up in our, um, nobody loves me, I, things never going to make it, I'll, I'll always be this way. And we start feeling down and depressed, you know, and those it goes like in a circle, right? We start feeling down, depressed. Nobody loves me. I'll never get out of this. I'll, things will never change. I'm nobody. I'm useless. I'm worthless. Nobody cares. I'm nobody care about me. There's nobody I can trust. You start getting caught up in this cycle, right, of thoughts. Having somebody to challenge that, to say, hey, wait a minute, is this really true? Having somebody to push back on those thoughts. Because at that particular moment, when you're in your in that depression zone, you're not pushing back. You're not challenging those negative thoughts. You're not saying, okay, where's the proof? You're not pulling out a pen on paper and say, okay, prove to me what you're saying is true. Okay? You can tell me about what happened. Okay, this happened to me. But you have no guarantee. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. One of our slogans here is make hope an option. Hope is always an option. Okay, but when we're depressed, when we're sad, when we're caught up in that moment, that's all we know is that depression is that sadness. So again, uh, six financial problems. Okay, is another um, another reason why relationship issues, bullying and cyberbullying, access to means, hopelessness. Okay, so again, I'm gonna just kind of read these again. 10 reasons that I came up with why people die by suicide, okay? Um, again, number one is mental health disorders. 
reference National Institute of Mental Health. You can go on their website. You can get this information. You can also go on our website, igbatt.com, and we have a link to it. But okay, mental health disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression is a big one, substance abuse, chronic pain and physical illness, social isolation, financial problems, relationship issues, bullying, cyberbullying, access to means, meaning you have easy access to lethal means, feelings of hopelessness, okay? These are just 10 reasons why people may die by suicide. Now, one of the things that is the strongest prediction, I, I, I'm not going to, if I was showing it, you can see, but one of the, the biggest, the strongest prediction, or one of the strongest prediction is hopelessness. Hopelessness, a perva pervasive sense of hopelessness when an individual believes their situation will never improve is a critical predictor of suicide. When a person has these thoughts that, I, you know, my family would be better off or my family, you know, they, they don't care or I'm a burden or, you know, things would, life would be better off without me. At that particular moment, when a person begins to feel like there's no hope, that there is no other way out. There is no, you know, there's no, uh, nothing they can do. That is one of the uh, critical predictor of suicide, okay? So now the question comes up, okay, why do, you know, some people die by suicide? As I said, there are a lot of different reasons. There's no one. We do know that depression plays a major role. Um, however, everybody who's depressed may not die by suicide, but we know that untreated, poorly treated, depression in particular, mental illnesses is a big predictor, okay? We know hopelessness along with that, that is also another big predictor going together. So the question is, okay, you tell me about, you know, you listed these 10 reasons. Again, you can go on the National Institute of Mental Health website, igbatt.com. You can find this information. But the question is, why do some people, some people die by suicide while others do not? Why do some people who are dealing with the same issues, with the same concerns, with the same situations, choose suicide, choose to die by suicide, and others do not? And when I use that word choose, you know, at that particular moment, the person feels like there is not an, an, an option. They feel like that's their, their only option. It's not about um, them trying to be selfish, because I've heard that. Oh, that's so selfish. You're not thinking about your family. At that particular moment, when you're really down and depressed, and you're really, you know, you're not thinking about anybody. All you're thinking about is the pain. All you're thinking about is the pain that you're in at the moment, and the pain that you feel that maybe you're causing other people. And at that particular moment, you don't see an option. At that particular op moment, it's, it's all this is 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 like this. Or you can see you don't see a way out. You know you look around you don't see a way out. That's why it's so important to have treatment. That's why it's so important that when you have other people to kind of challenge that. But when you are um, isolated, when you're dealing with your depression or a poorly treated depression, dealing with alcohol, or when you're dealing with a particular illness, you become lonely and you don't have anyone to talk to or the right people to talk to. This is all you know, right? So you're kind of just wedged in. All of these negative thoughts have you kind of um, I don't have one in my thing here. But you're just kind of um, locked in, right? That's why it's so important that when you have people to come alongside you um, to say, okay, treatment, people, right? This is what, why it's so important. You can see one of the things that the enemy would try to get us to do, he likes it when people are isolated. He likes it, you know, when you hear people say, you know, that's why I'm going to stay by myself. I don't like people. People don't like me. You know, no, that's not true. We were not designed to live in a vacuum. We were not designed to be alone, to live alone. Now, there's nothing wrong with living alone. I'm not talking about living alone. But we're not, we're not designed to just be alone, isolated, right? We're not designed to to live like that. We are designed to live life. We can't get let our negative situations, our past trauma, you know, our past hurts to cause us to retreat back into uh, away from life. Whatever life looks like that, whatever it looks like for you, you need to live life, right? You know, I'm not saying that you want to go out 
You don't need a hundred people, but you want to find something that you like to do, that you like being a part of, so that you can engage. Because what happens is, is when we are alone, when we're isolated, the only thoughts that we have to confer with are our own thoughts. And when we get caught up in this negative, like I said before, these negative thoughts, these negative feelings, we don't have anybody to challenge those thoughts. So again, why some people die by suicide while others do not? Protective factors are those factors that um, that we have in our life or that we have around us or that we can develop that can protect us from certain things. So, for example, yes, I may live in a very trauma-triggering um, home. I may live in a home that's um, financially things are not going well, right? I may live in a home where there's a lot of crime, where there's a lot of violence, where there's a lot of, you know, my parents are abusive. I may live in this particular home, right? But there is at least a neighbor down the street. There's a church up the street where there are people there that who speak life into me. So when we think of protective factors, think of it as protective factors are those things that mitigate the negative things that are going on in my life. So yes, I may have five people, my mother, father, or whoever, saying that you're never going to make it, you're never going to be anybody. But then when I go over here to church or when I go over here to, uh, to school, there's that one person that's saying, you know what, you're going to be a wonderful person. Is that one person that's really pouring life into me. That's a protective factor. Schools, churches, um, anything that's positive to you that can be a protective factor. So w when we look at this, as I read this, let's keep that in mind. So why do some people die by suicide while others do not? Resilience and coping skills. Individuals with strong resilience and effective coping skills are better equipped to handle life stressors and traumas. Okay? Resilience and coping skills. Some people are just more resilient. Um, whether some of that is because they they developed it along the way. They were born with it. Some people coping skills. They you know we learn coping skills, so it varies. Resilience and coping skills. These are things that we can work on that we can can develop. We can develop in general. Okay. Individuals with strong resilience and effective coping skills are better equipped to handle life stre stressors and traumas. One person may hear somebody yelling loud. And oh my God, they are just yelling, they are screaming so loud, and it just, it really bothers them, they're triggered. Somebody else can hear it and just walk away, it's no big deal. So, resilience and coping skills. Positive coping mechanism, social support, past experience of overcoming adversity. There are some people, you know, hey, I've been broke before, or I saw somebody else make it out, I can make it out. So again, Resilience and coping skills. We're talking about why some people die by suicide while others do not. Resilience and coping skills. Support systems. Having a robust network of friends, family, and community support can provide emotional and practical assistance during crisis. Factors, quality of relationships, community involvement, and access to support systems. Number three, access to mental health care. Early and, go and ongoing access to mental health care can prevent escalation of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Biological and genetic factors. Genetics can influence the predisposition to mental health conditions and the body's response to stress. Okay, family history of mental illness and the individual biological responses. Cultural and religious beliefs. Cultural and religious beliefs can provide a sense of purpose, hope, community, and deter suicidal thoughts. Personality traits, as I said before, traits such as optimism, adaptability, problem-solving skills can protect against suicidal behavior. Previous experience. People who have successfully navigated past crisis may have developed stronger coping skills. Perception of control. A belief in one's ability to influence outcomes in their life can reduce feelings of helplessness. Socioeconomic status. Intervention and prevention efforts. So again, let me read through this again and then I'm going to talk about it more. Why some people die by suicide while others do not. Number one, resilience and coping skills. Support systems. Access to mental health care, I should have put that as number one. Biological and genetic factors. 
cultural and religious beliefs, personality traits, previous experiences, perception of control, socioeconomic status, intervention and prevention efforts. Those are at least 10 reasons why individuals, why some people die by suicide while others do not. So let me talk more about these a little more. I started, but let me go back. Why some people die by suicide while others do not. Resilience and coping skills. These are things we can develop coping skills. We can take a look at how we're currently coping now and ask ourselves, the way I'm coping now, is it helping me or hurting me? Is it getting me closer to the goal that I have in life or is it pushing me further away? You can learn coping skills. Okay, so coping skills are things that we can, we can learn. Individuals with strong resilience and effective coping skills are better equipped to handle life stresses and traumas. Positive coping skills, social support, and past experiences of overcoming adversity all play a role. Number two, support systems. Having a robust network of friends, family, and community support can provide emotional and practical assistance during crisis. When you have somebody that you can call, when you have somebody that you can talk to, and you, and you may not be able to talk to your family, you may not be able to talk to your friends about certain things. You don't necessarily have to put all your eggs in one basket. You may have one friend for this, one friend for this, one friend for that. One family member, member may be better at handling this, one family member may be better at handling this. Just because your family member may not be able to handle all of your depression, all of your, your, your trauma experiences, things that you want to share, doesn't mean that they don't care or that they're not a good person. It just means that that's not what they're, um, they're there for. That's not their, their skill set. So again, finding people, there are people out there it may need to be a therapist, it may need to be a counselor, it may need to be um, your pastor or somebody at the church that you can talk to. And again, one person may not, you may need more than one person, and that's okay. You don't need to rely just on one person, or I, this one person here, I, it, it, they should be able to help me. My mother, my father, they should be able to listen to me and about all my problems. Because people will say, you know, I talk to my family and they don't want to hear. They get tired of hearing it. And it may be true. You may be absolutely right. They may be tired of hearing it, right? But that doesn't mean that they're not a bad person. It just means that, you know, they don't know what to, else to do. They don't know what to say. They don't know, okay, you know, they don't really understand it. And that doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just means that what you need to do is find other people. Right? To, to, you may have to go into therapy. You may need several therapists. You may need several counselors. Okay? So again, don't, you know, get mad at a person just because they, they can't be everything that you need them to be. No one person should really be everything. But, you know, again, just keep that in mind. Support systems are so important. And even sometimes, it's not even about having your family, friends, and network to share how you're feeling at that moment, sometimes they can be a distraction. Sometimes sports, going to sports, can be playing sports can be a distraction. And it also helps physically. So again, having a support system. Do not let your uh, past hurts, your past rejection, your past trauma keep you from having a support network. Your support network doesn't have to be a hundred people. It can only be, it can be only one or two, but it's important to have that support network. Access to mental health. Early and ongoing access to mental health care can prevent the escalation of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. 988. 988, if you live in the United States, is the National um, Suicide Hotline. You can Call them, text them, anytime, 24-7-988, and they will talk with you, and they will help connect you to someone in your particular area, okay? But access to mental health care, it varies where you are. Some places have um, better systems, some places have worse. But it's important for you to kind of find out what the, what is, the, um, system, what is, what is going on in your particular area and get the help that you need. So access to mental health care. 
early and ongoing access to mental health care can prevent the escalation of suicidal thoughts and behaviors.